from MDP and apart from the work that you're doing, so do you look at kind of the geroprotective world? And so what do you see as the most promising technology? So I think synolytics are a remarkable class of drugs that uh, is emerging as useful in a number of conditions and may eventually be the first uh, sort of dedicated therapeutics uh, candidate that will be available. Um, we already know that metformin has uh, promising uh, lifespan and health span promoting effects in models and perhaps in humans as well, as does rapamycin and you know the rapalog fields. Again, I think that geroscience has to grow up and accept that the future is precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think every person in the world should take metformin. I think there's a fair amount of us, I probably am one of them, that will benefit from metformin. Mm -hmm. I think that not everybody should be on rapamycin. I actually don't think that I will benefit from rapamycin. And because I think the geroprotective actions of rapamycin might be more cancer preventing, I think, and the geroprotective effects of uh, metformin might be more in the metabolic domain. And I think that that's just two crude categories. Um, I have, uh, you know, I shouldn't say these things on 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 national TV or wherever we are, but I, I probably will benefit likely, possibly from metformin, mm. but not from rapamycin. Other people might have the opposite. And I think that what we need is the kind of clinical trial development that will say, what are the genetic or epigenetic or biomarker or epigenetic clock-driven signature that say, Richard, you should be on rapamycin. Hasi, you should be on the foreman. Somebody else, you should be on this already approved synolytic that's now being redeveloped. I mean, some of these synolytics in clinical trials are repurposed approved drugs, right? So we are developing a panel of geoprotective drugs. Now we have to learn who to give what to before they actually develop an actual disease. You see what I'm saying? And there's yeah. more. There's so many geoprotective drug candidates now. How are you going to offer people which ones to take? We don't have that information yet, but we need to build the infrastructure for clinical trials with that in mind, that no drug is going to be right for everybody, and we're not going to give everybody all the drugs, for sure. So we're still missing something here. But yeah, we'll get, we'll get it, there. We'll get there. Yes, because I hadn't thought about that. I mean, I, I thought about precision medicine and, and how measuring is important in terms of deciding what it is you're you're going going to take, what what therapy, what intervention. But of course, yes, you also need it on the kind of on the clinical trial part be, to be able to target it, so you know how to target the different drugs. So, but within the current framework that would be very difficult because clinical trials are so heavy in terms of investment. Um, well, if you look at some of the Alzheimer's studies that were done to the tune of billions of dollars, and uh, I think there hasn't been sufficient uh, back end genomic and epigenetic evaluation, you know, mm. so uh, amyloid beta antibodies uh, don't work if you look at thousands and thousands of people. But then they say, well, maybe they work on a subpopulation, but how they define that subpopulation was sort of this clinical stage, a very early stage of Alzheimer's and those people may benefit. I think that there is a biomarker or a gene variant that will say people who have this abnormality are the ones that will benefit from amyloid beta antibodies. I don't know what that is, but I think that's what we should have been looking at. 
I think in the Alzheimer's field, particularly the biggest player, you know, I think schmooze is going to be a new angle. But the biggest player from a genetic perspective is what's known as ApoE4, which again, 20% of uh, the population has in several uh, ethnicities. And it dramatically increased the risk of Alzheimer's by at least twofold. And the biology is very specific. And people who have Alzheimer's without ApoE4 are going to be a different type of patient that Alzheimer's patient with the ApoE4 gene, and they're going to require different interventions. And the people are developing ApoE4 specific treatments. By the way, humanin might be one of those. And we have a paper and submission indicating that mice with ApoE4 uh, specifically seem to respond to humanin therapy. Uh, in terms of, say, amyloid deposition. But the bottom line is that the biggest mistake we're making in chronic diseases of aging is not accepting that diabetes and Alzheimer's and these type of conditions are not a disease. They're a constellation of many genetic conditions and syndrome that we lump together. But when we want to treat them, we're going to have to treat them more specifically with sort of targeted uh, uh, novel treatments that will be discovered or maybe are already here, but we haven't learned how to apply them correctly. Right. So uh, just uh, can you share your personal protocol? I mean, wh what is it that you do after, but based on all your research? Um, so I try to go for the tried and true proven things. I follow a Mediterranean diet. I am primarily a pescatarian. Uh, I try to get as much exercise as I can. Uh, I find that the problem with exercise, which is undoubtedly beneficial, is that it's not about wanting to exercise, it's about being able to exercise. So 65 years of abusing my body is preventing me now from running. I used to run 10K a day, which I don't recommend for people to run daily. Hmm. Uh, so now I try to do a lot of walking, 10,000 steps. I do a lot of hiking. I do yoga. I do meditation. I make sure I get enough sleep. I try to find purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And um, I also recognize that we have a limited time on this universe and you want to make it count both at the personal level and uh, uh around you um so yeah i i try to do some spiritual work uh, along with my academic work and personal work right excellent thanks for sharing that so if people want to find out more about yourself and your lab where can they go we have websites uh, at the uh, just Google uh, USC mm. Cohen Lab. Right. Okay. And we'll we'll put like, the link in. Yeah. yeah. And all your papers seem to be open. I, I found that when I was. Yeah. I, I all, all of my work is supported by NIH. Mm. And um, it is a requirement of NIH that all our publications be uh, available for free. And we facilitate that. Excellent. Yes, it was it was great reading. And I, and I particularly invite your readers to uh, seek out our new schmooze paper coming out next week. Excellent. I will definitely look look for that. And uh, yes, we will. It will come out before we re release the video, so I can find it and put the link in. Molecular psychiatry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, Professor Cohen, thank you for joining us today and it's been great and ho I hope we'll get a chance to talk again. I hope so, Richard. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you.